was British Rail's own view of York Station in 1952, and this is the way we look at it on Rail Watch live in 1989. Good afternoon to you. We're live at York Railway Station. York, very much a railway town, an important centre today, just as it was in the early days of railways. The home of a major railway works, the headquarters of one of BR's regions, and appropriately also the home of the National Railway Museum. And that's why we have chosen York as our base for Rail Watch. It's a week-long vigil at the heart of British Rail's eastern region. Well, British Rail seems to be in the news more often than not these days, and most of this morning's newspapers carry reports of a rather nasty incident in the early hours of Sunday morning when a gang of youths steamed a train, injuring and robbing passengers. This happened between St Albans and Hendon on London Midlands Thameslink service. It's one of the worst incidents of its kind to date. Later in the series, we will be at Leeds Station, which from time to time has its own problems of violence and vandalism. We'll be talking to British Transport Police representatives there about the railway's own police force and the job it has to do with incidents like Sundays, apparently on the increase all over the country. Every day this week, we'll also be covering live what happens day by day on one of our major railways and going where most passengers don't normally get to go. We're going to go behind the scenes. Rail watch is where we give you the chance to watch a railway actually at work literally looking over the shoulders of the drivers, the signalmen, the station masters and the controllers as they keep the trains, the people and the freight on the move. Just like them, we have absolutely no idea what problems might crop up during this week, but if a problem does arise, we've every intention of uh, being there with them as they solve it. Also, we'll do our level best to get behind some of the mysteries and complexities that go into running a railway, and do believe me, it is a very complex business. We've chosen the eastern region of British Rail because it contains such a rich variety of all the work of a railway, from high-speed intercity trains to long-haul freight work, from single branch lines to one of the country's biggest modern signalling centres. And in the course of the week, we're going to try and take a look at everything that goes on. We have a full team of people, for this is a, a big railway and there is a lot going on. In today's programme, we'll be looking at London's King's Cross at one end of the track and at the other, north of the border, Edinburgh's Waverley Station. Somewhere in the middle of all that is Doncaster Signalling Centre, one of the biggest and busiest in Europe. And here in York, quite literally mission control it's actually called regional control and it's the headquarters of the eastern region well the southern end of eastern region is the london terminus of the east coast main line it's at king's cross and earlier this morning rail watch in general and penny buston in particular took a very special train to heart with help from dr john prido director of intercity well, could i just say how much we welcome the chance for viewers to join us and look over our shoulders at the complex job of running a railway 24 hours a day and for all our passengers uh, long distance passengers, commuters, leisure passengers, business travellers for, for freight customers and for parcels customers and we do hope that by the end of this week you'll share our enthusiasm for the future of the railway it now gives me a lot of pleasure to name this locomotive BBC Television Rail Watch. So, fully christened, power car 43108 heads off to Leeds. But this isn't a new locomotive. In fact, it's been in service since 1978 and has clocked up some two and a quarter million miles. But until today, it didn't have a name. Back from the days of steam, we've always named express engines particularly. Indeed, I suppose Stevenson's rocket was one of the first. When the steam engines disappeared, the practice sort of died out. We've realised in recent years that people like to see a name. There's a romance attached to long-distance trains, and it's nice to see a name that's associated with the train you're travelling on, the places you're going, things that happen on the route. How more appropriate than BBC Railwatch? As well as following the progress of our adopted power car all this week, we're also dogging the footsteps of one very special British Rail employee, a man who has the job that every little boy and a few older ones are said to dream about. The start of another working day, and while many people pass through King's Cross on their way to work, for one man this is where the day really begins. John Swaby, our adopted train driver. On Wednesday he'll be celebrating 35 years working man and boy on Britain's railways. His first task is to clock in and check his rosters for the day. 
The drivers all have to pick up weekly operating notices giving precise details of track repairs which could mean delays on their routes. Once satisfied he's abreast of the latest information, John heads off for the first trip of the day. He started work when steam trains were a common sight at King's Cross, but today he's taking one of the latest intercity 125s to Leeds. Were you a little boy who always wanted to be a train driver? Yes, I think from, I actually stayed on at school for six months because I couldn't get onto the uh, footplate. And then um, six months after my 15th birthday, I, I uh, managed to get on. So this is a fairy tale come true? Oh, yes. <laughs> Could you ever imagine, imagine doing anything else? No, uh, no, I, from an early age I always wanted to, uh, to come on the train, yes. I don't know why, I suppose it's, uh, we used to go train spotting when I was a young fellow. And it just sort of went on from there. What's your average day like? What are you doing today? Well, it varies now. Uh, today we're going to take the train to Leeds and then uh, have a break and then we come back. And tomorrow we go to York uh, and then... Um, it doesn't happen like that every week. Sometimes we just go from King's Cross to the Deco. Uh, with the night trains for cleaning and then after the being cleaned fetching back in for the morning service. So we get a variation of, uh, of the jobs. You know. But how many journeys would you expect to do in an average day? Um, well you only go Leeds and back once or York and back once and some of the older drivers go Newcastle and back. Uh, you only do that once because you haven't got enough time to get back there. So. You say some of the older drivers don't you go to Newcastle? No, no, no. no I'm, I've been on the job 35 years, but uh, not old enough yet. <laughs> it could be a lot longer. They're about, um, been on the job about 38 years before they get in there. Really? Really, yes. Why? Is it difficult up that way? No, no, no. Seniority. Uh, it's based on, you progress through the links on your, whatever your seniority is. So you're still a boy? Still a boy, yeah. <laughs> so they say. They will after this, anyhow. <laughs> what do you feel about being followed by us all this week? I don't know yet, you've only just started, haven't you? I think it'll be interesting. It'll be interesting and give the insight to the public of uh, what the job appertains to. John Swaby, we're staying with for the week, just beside me at the moment to give you an idea of what goes on here at York. Just leaving now, that is actually the 8 o'clock service from Inverness to London, uh, which left Inverness at 8 o'clock this morning. It was due here 27 minutes ago. It's running 27 minutes late. They've had a few problems north of here this morning. And there it goes at 13.54 off towards King's Cross. The scale of the organization that our driver John Swaby works for is mind-boggling. Here in our studio is Rob Curling to explain further. British Rail is run by the British Railways Board that was set up to manage all aspects of the running of Britain's railways. To make it manageable on a day-to-day -day basis, most aspects of railway management have to be broken down into workable sized chunks. The business sectors are the people who actually sell us the particular service we might be using. British Rail refers to us all now as customers, which is at least a business-like way of looking at the problem, shows they've got the priorities the right way around. And the money which we pay goes to whichever business sector we happen to be using. The business sectors then pay the operations end of British Rail to run their trains on the railway. Intercity is a business sector which sells and runs high-speed passenger services. Other business sectors are Network South East and Provincial also dealing with passengers, the last two being freight and parcels. This whole idea of having business sectors is relatively new in railway terms, less than 10 years old. And it explains all those different colour schemes you see on the trains, with each sector trying to market its own services and establish its own identity. Now most business sectors operate on a nationwide basis, so you have intercity or freight sector trains anywhere in the country. But the operation side of the railway is structured regionally. There are six of them, familiar names to most of us, and the bit that we're taking particular interest in this week is British Rail's eastern region, stretching from London to the Scottish border and from the Pennines in the west to the east coast. The spine of the region is the east coast main line, running from King's Cross in London across the border to Waverley Station in Edinburgh. Well, the main business of the East Coast Main Line, or at least the bit that everybody immediately thinks of, is moving people. On many other countries' railways now, if you want to travel any great distance on a train, you have to book and buy your ticket in advance, the same way that you do on an airline. But here in Britain, we still operate a walk-on, on-demand service. 
Our intercity trains are in many ways the flagships of British Rail, the bit that most of us see most often. On Eastern Region, intercity carries nearly 2 million passengers a year. That totals up to 2,000 million miles. The director of intercity you saw earlier on, Dr John Prido, is talking to Penny Buston at King's Cross. Dr. Prudhoe, can you start by explaining for me what is Intercity and who are your customers? Well, Intercity is the main line network in this country, so we're running most long-distance trains. Our customers, about a quarter of our customers will be travelling on business, about a third will be visiting friends and relatives, and the rest will be going on holiday or personal business or a whole range of jobs like that. How do you compete? We compete very widely because we actually have 7% of the long distance travel market in this country. So we're competing with cars, and we're competing with coaches, and we're competing with air. And we compete, compete on quality mainly and on price. You have a very complicated fare structure. Why does it need to be that complex? Well, it needs to be complicated because we're carrying 80 million passengers a year on Intercity. And they're a very broad range of people and we have to have a fare structure which will appeal to each of those people for different journeys and that inevitably leads to a, quite a range of fares. Doesn't it lead to confusion as well sometimes? Oh, we don't get it entirely right, but it inevitably will range, lead to a wide range of fares because after all, the person who is travelling perhaps at a weekend to, to, to visit a friend long distance away will not necessarily be prepared to pay the same sort of price that they might do if they were travelling in business midweek. I, for one, have travelled on Intercity, where for a large part of a very expensive journey I've had to stand. Other people have, have horror stories like that to tell as well. Why is it that often there are spaces in first class yet I'm stood standing in the second class area? Well, they do occasionally happen, and of course we have... Uh, one of our, our investments in quality has been an investment in people, the senior conductors, who I'm sure you'll be meeting this week. And they have quite a lot of, uh, of ability to actually move people around. But in general, about 1% of our passengers will be standing. We do work, 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 operate a service where people can walk on. You're not forced to pre-book. And under those circumstances, inevitably, as demand peaks at times, you will get t some occasions when people do stand. But it is something we do our best to avoid. Some people might wonder why you couldn't perhaps put on another coach. Well, as you'll see during this week, again, in order to get efficient, efficient use of our train sets, we, we do have to, to make uh, very intensive use of them. And it, you, you have to think of a train under those circumstances being a train set, complete from one end to the other, not something that you attach and detach the odd coach from. That leads to very few journeys a day, and in fact, many fewer seats out on the railway during the day. You're investing a great deal of money in the electrification of the East Coast main line, yet your high-speed trains already achieve average speeds of around 100 miles an hour. Well, they're doing about 100 miles an hour on average, and they're doing 125 miles an hour in fact, for quite a lot of the journey. The advantages of electrification are, are various. I mean, firstly, it is a major investment, so it gives us an opportunity to produce new trains, new levels of comfort for passengers, and in fact, we hope, also longer trains, answering one of your previous questions. Secondly, it ought to be a lot more economical, because with an electric train, you can actually have a more powerful train with one locomotive, while the trains we've got behind us, the high-speed trains, will have two locomotives. So it should be more economical as a proposition. And will it be and environmentally sound as well? Oh, I think environmentally very sound, because of course there's really no pollution from an electric train. And also, I think, slightly faster, because by, the, by 1991, when we get to Edinburgh with our electrification, we'll be aiming to get to Edinburgh, Edinburgh in four hours, compared to just under four and a half hours now. And you're back live at York now on Rail Watch. Electrification brings us even faster trains, but already the intercity high-speed trains which run on this East Coast main line are amongst the fastest in the world. It is an East Coast intercity HST which currently holds the world record for a train hauled by a diesel locomotive. The speed, 148 miles an hour on this line from Darlington to York back in November 87. Now, the line has always been associated with fast runs and with record breaking. And at the National Railway Museum here in York, Rob Curling, has been buffing up the polish on the most famous record breaker of them all. Splendidly restored in the pre-war blue livery of the London and North Eastern Railway's express locomotive fleet, this is the record breaker. On the 3rd of July 1938, this engine, Mallard, took a seven-coach test train down Stoke Bank on the East Coast Main Line from Grantham to Peterborough and topped 126 miles per hour a record for a steam engine and a feat that has never been bettered. 
Mallard has pride of place here at the National Railway Museum at York, home of a remarkable collection of locomotives, rolling stock and all manner of artefacts and records which relate to the 150-year history of Britain's railways. The museum, which is part of the National Museum of Science and Industry that includes the Science Museum in London, opened in 1975. But many of these exhibits were inherited from an earlier York Railway Museum, which housed a largely East Coast collection. For it was in the northeast of England that railways first developed. George Stevenson, often called the father of the railways, came from Tyneside and built the world's first public railway, the Stockton and Darlington. The famous rocket built by George's son Robert in Newcastle in 1829 for the Liverpool and Manchester Railway is generally recognised as the most influential of the early types, setting the pattern for everything that came after it. This is a working replica built in 1979 for the 150th anniversary celebrations. It looks very different from Mallard, but the important thing to remember is that although almost 100 years separate them, they both work on exactly the same principle and many of the basic design features are the same. Mallard was in the great tradition of the East Coast Flyers. And here is another one, Patrick Sterling's single of 1870, so called because it had one huge eight-foot diameter driving wheel. It's as handsome and elegant piece of design as you'll find anywhere, but it was also a highly effective machine. The Great Northern Railway built it for speed, as speed was now becoming important. There'd always been great rivalry between the two main lines connecting England with Scotland, the West Coast Line and the East Coast Line. In the 1880s and again in the 1890s, the rivalry had become so intense that the companies were racing each other to get their trains to Scotland in the fastest time. At the beginning of 1888, the East Coast trains were doing the journey to Edinburgh in nine hours. By the end of that summer, the fastest train had done the same journey in just under seven and a half hours. And that's a remarkable achievement for the railways of a hundred years ago. And this engine worked the London to York leg of the route, often running at speeds of up to 70 miles per hour for long periods. 50 years later, a similar rivalry led the London and Northeastern Railway to build luxury high-speed trains, the Silver Jubilee, and a special class of streamlined locomotives to haul them. A familiar shape? Yes, Mallard was a stablemate. And this class of engine was used to work non-stop runs between King's Cross and Edinburgh before the war and, as we see here, in the 1950s. Now that journey, the longest non-stop run in the world, took six hours. On the face of it, perhaps not much improvement in 50 years, but of course the trains were now much longer and heavier and much more comfortable than they'd been in Victorian times. But six hours was too long for one crew to do all the driving and firing of the engine. So the designers introduced a novel feature, a corridor through the tender of the locomotive, past where coal and water for the engine was carried, to connect with the carriages of the train, so that a second crew could take over halfway through the journey. Well, railway engines, no matter how fast or how beautiful they are, are only one element in running a railway. Just coming in beside me live here at York now. This is on time. It's a high-speed train set off from Newcastle and is due in at King's Cross in London at uh, just six minutes to four this afternoon. And due to leave here on time at about 14.36, we hope. I'm sat right beside the power car, 27,000 horsepower packed inside there to uh, get it going at 125 miles an hour down the line. And it, it really is a fantastic sight, but it's not just the engines that are important. The signalling system which controls where and how fast the trains can run is equally important. Paul Coyer is at the East Coast Main Line's biggest signal centre, just south of here at Doncaster. Paul. Well, within the past minute, we've had a bit of drama here at Doncaster. The wind has whipped up, and as you can see as we close in there, one of the parcel trolleys from the station has fallen onto the line. The guys have just tried to remove it there, and uh, there it goes. That was holding up the traffic here in Doncaster station. So drama live here at BBC Television. If we just pan to the left, you'll see that there is a great heritage in the railways here at Doncaster, because just behind those red sandstone buildings, it's where that famous Mallard train that Rob was telling you about was built, and the Flying Scotsman was built 
built there too. And if you thought that signal boxes today were full of guys with rolled up sleeves pulling levers, well welcome to the 20th century. This signalling centre replaced 52 of the old style signal boxes, but there is still a few reminders around of the past. This, for instance, well, this reminds us of when dinosaurs ruled the earth. The old style was for the signalman to do that and signal to the guy up the line that the line was clear, or alternatively, if there was a train blocking the way, it went that way. It was a bit cumbersome, and this has now been replaced by a little perspex switch, just like that. Well, with me now is the area manager for Doncaster, Gordon Dennis. Gordon, it is good that you still do remember the important steam heritage of British Rail. Yes, it's part of our heritage and it's appropriate that we keep it as a reminder here in a, a modern signal box. So, our Rail Watch train, going from, say, King's Cross to the borders, how many miles would it cross? From King's Cross to the Scots border, about 340 miles. And how many miles of that would you look after here in the signalling centre? Within Doncaster signalling centre, there's 70 miles, of which the signal box looks after about 155 route miles within that complex. What are the financial considerations for you of keeping the system running smoothly? Obviously, you don't want to upset the passengers, but in terms of pure finance, if you have a train standing still, what does it cost? Well, of course, keeping the... Uh, the trains on time for the public is of course the, the paramount matter but if a train comes to a stand we are using scarce resources that have to be intensively used and if trains stand they take a long time to regain uh, their maximum speed there's a penalty for fuel on us what about every time the guy applies the brake unnecessarily perhaps well if on a high speed train you just touch the brake you literally burn a five pound note and of course as the train breaks further and further to the schedule rate that penalty increases so obviously it all adds up you also look after the level crossings here i notice it's done by closed circuit television that's right there are a mixture of crossings in the area there's a, about a hundred in total but uh, a number of them are monitored remotely from this signal box by closed circuit television. Now, obviously, in the olden days, one signalman could effect a signal, but look out the window and check that it had actually come into effect. You can't do that here because they're so far away. How confident are you that when you press a button, the signal does actually operate? Simply because the systems are all electronically interlocked, and one can observe the passage of the train through a route being cleared on the panel uh, a succession of white lights indicates that the route is clear and as the train passes along the panel it moves to red lights indicating the position and returning signals to danger so what we can see the there train. on the screen is actually a train passing through that's right okay gordon thank you very much indeed thank you well of course it is a big center that we have here in doncaster but big though it is it only covers part of the british rail network between here and the borders there's many miles and they are controlled by this by signal boxes, there are routes, there are all sorts of things, and they come under the guidance of York, which is the headquarters for the English section of the Eastern Region. Waiting for us there is Rob Curling. Yes, this room deals with the whole of Eastern Region, which includes the main line from King's Cross to the Scottish border. Now here we can get a general picture of the movement of the high-speed trains and to an extent the local provincial services. Now, although the uh, operating centres at Newcastle, Leeds, Doncaster and King's Cross would deal with any isolated incidents such as uh, power failure on a train, uh, signalling fault or crewing shortage, it's here that the ultimate operating decisions are made. Now, for example, if a tree were to fall on the line blocking the track in the Doncaster area, they'd be informed here because it would affect the services across the whole line, so they might have to reroute uh, trains or reschedule some services, maybe even cancel some, so they have to shuffle things around to get the system back to normal as quickly as possible. Now, we'll be here all week monitoring this just to make sure that the system runs smoothly or not. We'll see. Now, these people in front of me are responsible for the freight and uh, locomotives in the region and uh, they are responsible for the deployment of all the region's diesel locomotives and for the trafficking of freight across the whole of the British Rail network. Now they're assisted by this computer which is called a TOPS computer which stands for Total Operations Processing System and it can tell you the whereabouts of every single piece of rolling stock on British Rail. So if you want to know where a particular little wagon is, it can tell you where whether it's on a siding, which particular siding it's on, whether it's part of a train, what it's carrying, and where in the train it is, whether it's at the front, in the middle, or at the back. And it's interesting also to note that uh, freight trains run to a timetable, as do passenger trains. 
Well, over here is the passenger side dealing principally with high-speed trains. Now, you may not realize that when you're sitting in a train, you're not just with the company of the driver, the guard, and the other passengers, but someone else is keeping a very watchful eye over you. Through these teleprinters here, linked to the signaling system, they can tell exactly where a train is and if it's running to time. Now, if you're stuck at a signal for hours on end, don't worry, because these guys know about it. And if there are delays, it's the job of the passenger controller to uh, get things running smoothly again. But with me now is Andy Payne, who's the Deputy Chief Controller here at York. Andy, have you had any problems at all this morning? Slight problems with uh, a signalling cable in the northeast, which affected services from Scotland and Newcastle, and the broken window incident with the 655 from Edinburgh. Now, that actually came into York uh, earlier on this morning, and we managed to, to see it arriving with this broken window. What exactly happened there? Well, they stopped in the Tolerton area to report via a signal post telephone that somewhere in the North Allen uh, patch they'd sustained this uh, incident and with that information we were able to arrange to platform it in a suitable place at York, right. um, get the fitting staff alerted, the station staff and fit a replacement uh, and that, emergency window. that's a temporary window. window that they've just fitted? That's right. Got, and, any, any other, and that would have delayed it by a few minutes presumably? Yes, in fact they did it with uh, a five minute delay at York mm -hmm. Station, a very good performance. All right Andy, not bad at all, thank you very much indeed. Well from this relatively high tech area with all the computers, we move over here where we uh, past this uh, telephone communications unit which is actually what they are using currently i know it looks a bit out of date but they are modernizing the system here that will f probably find its uh, home in a museum fairly shortly but we go surprisingly low tech here because the hst controller although working with computers uses a card index system because it's actually much easier to get an at a glance idea of what's going on all these rows represent various trains so if you look here you can see this train has uh, a power car at the north end, a power car at the south end, and these are all the coaches in the middle. Now, every single piece of rolling stock on British Rail has its own unique identity. You may have seen the numbers written on the sides of coaches. Well, that's what these refer to. Now, this particular train, we can look, is in fact, the would have been the 8 o'clock from Inverness to King's Cross, which we saw pulling out of York just a few minutes ago. Uh, it would then do the 5 o'clock service from King's Cross to Glasgow, and finally the 11 o'clock service tonight from Glasgow to Edinburgh. It will cover, cover a total of 1,070 three miles today that train now there are 40 of these train sets as they're called operating so they'll cover something like between them 40,000 miles in a day which is quite something that means that in a week you could get to the moon with British Rail which is quite something now the HST maintenance controller uh, can give instant advice to a driver who may have technical problem via a telephone. Uh, the telephone isn't in the cab as yet, but he can use a trackside phone. And he also directs uh, um, a unit of travelling engineers who can get on a train and actually are capable of repairing it while it's on the move. And he has details of any problems that a train may have. For instance, he will have got details of the broken window that we knew about. And he has now phoned ahead. He's found out with this system where that coach will end up at the end of its working day and knows to inform the depot that they have to replace that window tonight. And there may be other problems like a problem with the engine or something as simple and as unlikely as a bit of chip formica on the table in the coach, which maybe wouldn't uh, warrant uh, pulling the train out of service. But if your train was cancelled this morning anywhere on Eastern Region, then these are the men who had to make that decision. Mike. Rob Curling, who is available for after-dinner speaking. So much for what happens behind the scenes in the bits of the railway that you, the passenger, never get to see. But even at the bits that you do see, the stations, there is a lot that goes on that we probably never even notice because we just arrive at the station, we get off the train, and we just walk away. Malcolm... Mac the 6.52 service from Newcastle disgorges its passengers at the end of the line. Some 220 trains arrive in King's Cross each and every day. About a quarter of those are into city services from stations up and down the east coast. The furthest departure point is Inverness, which is some eight hours away. Now, the average high-speed train is eight coaches long, which means that it can carry some 460 passengers. And as on, say, this three-hour journey from Newcastle, they would have taken full advantage of the catering and toilet facilities on board. So, before this can become the 10.35 departure to Hull, a certain amount of housekeeping has to take place. They pride themselves here that they can turn the train round in just 30 minutes. An army of cleaners are waiting to start their assault on the muck and mess left behind by some of the 25 million passengers who use King's Cross each year. And fitters are there too to check each train's railworthiness.
The key thing is to make sure that the train is in a fit state uh, to do its return journey. So the fitters obviously get on board and they're checking fuel uh, and also coolant. And then immediately that's declared that we can use the train. Then obviously the cleaners join the train. Uh, and they work through the train, usually one per coach, and in first-class accommodation uh, they'll do two between one, uh, and also they'll go to the toilets. So it's quite an involved procedure, and there's quite a number of people on the train at once. Is it quite a difficult task for the cleaners? It is very much so. Uh, it depends on the journey length that the train has come in from. If it's an Inverness and Aberdeen service, obviously uh, the debris is, is much greater than if it's just a Leeds one. So, uh, yes, it takes longer for uh, longer distance. What sort of debris do you get left on a train? Well, there's quite a mountain of rubbish nowadays. It's a revolution in plastic cups and trays. Uh, when you buy a cup of tea, you're getting the cup and the saucer and the uh, milk, etc. So it's quite a lot of items. Um, and also there's a fair amount of personal luggage that is left. Um, uh, wallets, briefcases, and there's a whole mountain of umbrellas quite often. You can tell this is Britain then if it's umbrellas? Very much so, yes. So when everything has been done, is it your job then to check the train? Uh, no, I have senior supervisors uh, who go around looking for quality uh, and inspect each train to make sure that it is at this level that we require and we're expecting. Uh, but I do like to make an occasional check myself to make sure that we are maintaining that quality. And do all your staff have bowler hats? <laughs> no, it's just the assistant station manager that actually wears this on a duty basis. Very smart of it too. Thank you very much. So Joe, what's on the menu for lunch today? Uh, rack of lamb. Sole and uh, turkey and ham pie. And have you prepared all that in here? The only thing that comes prepared is the pie. Everything else we prepare as we go along. It must be rather cramped working in here. No, no. well it is, but uh, it's, it's not too bad. You get used to it after a while. So how long have you been doing this? I've been back on British Rail nearly two years. You must enjoy it then. But what's the favourite dish? English. English. Um, steak, steak kidney pie. Things like that, pork chops, good grills. It's English food is still the most popular food on the train. Do you have, ever have any complaints? Oh, yeah. I write passengers always. Same as anywhere, any restaurant. You get people complaining, rightly or wrongly. Still good. Do they also come and uh, thank you? Yes, occasionally. But not often enough? I don't really want them to. Why? I don't know. I'd just rather be left to get on with my job. We'll, we'll leave you to do it then. Thanks very much. Okay. Which one is bigger? That one's bigger. So the 10.35 to Hull is um, almost clean enough to depart. Potential passengers, meanwhile, have either been to the travel centre to buy their tickets or rung the inquiry office. The telephone system here is computerised and they pride themselves on the swiftness of their response. Good morning, King's Cross Inquiries. Well, two leads, they leave at 20 minutes past every hour. Uh, that's with your student's rail car. This is one of four large telephone inquiry bureau in central London. The computer system means that calls are automatically distributed amongst the 14 staff, both to ensure that the caller isn't kept waiting and that the workload is spread. Daily, they cope with three and a half thousand calls. The aim of this bureau is to answer all our calls within 30 seconds. Currently we're achieving something like 93-95% of the calls are being answered in that time. Computer printout from last Friday shows that we had 3,600 calls. The longest anyone waited in that time was 121 seconds. What time did that happen? This was about 7.30, 8 o'clock. It's when most of the daytime staff were going off duty, so our staffing level was lower at that time. So that's your excuse? That's our excuse, yes. Do your staff here have to go to charm school to deal with difficult customers? All staff currently go to a customer service course, and I think it does help. Do they sometimes get difficult people? We do occasionally, but you just have to be charming and hope that you're going to win them over. Back downstairs, as the aroma of rack of lamb starts to drift down the carriages, the final brake check is made before departure. Then it's all aboard that's going aboard. This train is no longer standing at Platform 8 at King's Cross. Another of our team, Malcolm McCaig, was at the other end of the East Coast Main Line at Edinburgh's Waverley Station just yesterday afternoon. 
stonily guarded by the author of the Waverley novel, Sir Walter Scott, as he presides over Princess Street traffic from underneath his baroque umbrella, Edinburgh's Waverley Station is the northern terminus of our East Coast main line. But it's far from being the end of the line itself for the long-haul intercity 125s that left King's Cross some six hours ago and some 400 miles away. From here, the trains can go on through west to Glasgow on the west coast or forward to Aberdeen and right up to Inverness in the north. Nowadays, Waverley is taken for granted and it's almost unnoticed, but it wasn't always thus. When the station and its lines were being built about a century ago, they were the centre of a furore, with opponents of the scheme complaining that to build a line here would defile and desecrate the heart of a very beautiful city and its surrounding countryside. But in fact, what happened was that both the station and the lines were very cleverly concealed. The station was built in a fold of land that was once an ancient herb garden. The East Coast Main Line emerges from a tunnel right underneath where I'm now standing. And the opportunity was taken to rationalise the layout of the branch lines that served Perth, Dundee, Leith and Aberdeen. So the station's laid out with parallel through tracks that once the trains have gone through Waverley, they take them on through a tunnel underneath Edinburgh's famous mound and then through a very deep cutting round the back of the castle. You would barely know the railway is there. But once inside, there's a warm enough welcome, as well as the occasional reminder of days gone by. But then, or now, the business of a railway station is moving people, and that's the job of assistant station manager, Bob Dow. Bob, what sort of traffic are you dealing with here now? The passengers, we've got an awful lot of passengers now coming in to Edinburgh. Edinburgh is not the north. We seem like that to the people from the south, but you've got to go further north. We'll go to Inverness, Aberdeen go to Glasgow and we've got to provide, we've got connections to these and we've got to watch the people coming in to make their connections. But unfortunately, not everybody who does come in does make the connection. That too turns out to be a job for Bob Dow. Bob, this can't help. Somebody just turning up with a three-saddle bicycle and the train's due to leave in what, 30 well, seconds? That's correct. He was actually on the train. We're waiting on his friend coming in for the tickets, but he's not got them, so unfortunately we can't let him travel. No <laughs> ticket, you can't travel. Disappointment for the moment for one customer at least, but the story has a happy ending. His friend got a ticket, found him, and although he missed the early evening southbound train from Waverley, he was able to catch one later that night. Well, we don't think Malcolm McCabe is going to see any more daylight this week because a railway is a round-the-clock, 24-hour operation, and we promise to let you see how all of it works. So somebody had to go on our own rail watch night shift. Guess who? The coming of night is far from being the signal for the end of the working day at Edinburgh Waverley. There are departures and connections for passenger services for King's Cross and Leeds, and later on, the night Scotsman has to provide the traveller not just with a bed, but with somewhere to carry more than merely hand luggage. Some people like to take their cars on the train. Mind you, taking your car on the train is something that requires just a little bit more planning and forethought than turning up at the barrier with a ticket and three minutes to go. The six wagons of the motor rail service to London are being loaded now at 10 o'clock at night on Waverley Station. Once they're completed, the shunter behind me will take them out of the motor rail siding round to platform 21 where they'll be buttoned onto the sleeper cars for the night Scotsman service to London, arriving there about breakfast time tomorrow morning. All this goes on in addition to the general passenger traffic on the station. And it's just yet another thing that assistant station manager Bob Dow has to make sure goes to plan. Bob, with the expansion of the motorway system, I would have thought that motor rail was a service that British Rail would almost be winding down. Oh no, on the contrary, Malcolm. In fact, it's a service now we're expanding. As from May, the May timetable, we'll actually be running a daytime service. And since... Oh, the last few years we've been expanding the service from Edinburgh. We used to have three, we've now doubled, we've got uh, six vehicles going this service. So, uh, what sort of people use motor rail and, and where does motor rail take from? People, it's the, the businessman that goes down, it's the people who want to arrive fresh at the destination, they can just go out there and drive in their car. 
uh, to also to people to save them in the weather like tonight. Uh, as you see, there's a frost on the roads. There's no problem there. They're in their beds. They don't have to worry about the state of the roads. It could be snow, ice. They'll still get there at the back of 6 o'clock tomorrow morning. And uh, they have to book clearly. You can't just turn up with your car and bring it on the train. How difficult is that? What sort of notice do you need? That's correct. No, what, what they do, there's uh, the motor rail office now for the whole of the, the UK is actually centralised in Edinburgh, Waverley. Uh, that's just opened up quite recently. And uh, they just contact by phone um, if there's vacancy that could be done on the night. But uh, we are very busy on this service. And tonight, uh, February, we've actually got 10 motor vehicles on this. It's a fairly leisurely way to travel from Edinburgh to London. Sleeping cars anyway don't do more than 100 miles an hour. And this one will arrive tomorrow about 6.30 in Euston, not in King's Cross, because with the East Coast Main Line being electrified, just temporarily, all the sleeping car services now run down the West Coast. For some reason, they always seem to want to stop just outside the station and start again. My own theory is it's so that you're jolted awake just in time to get up and come back to the lounge and have breakfast. Sadly, the famous British rail breakfast is now a thing of the past. We're into airline catering, even on the sleepers. So you get two chipolatas and an omelette and some tomatoes and some fried bread, all in a little plastic dish heated in the microwave. Of course, with nearly all intercity lines now welded rail instead of jointed track, you no longer get that lovely clickety-clack, clickety-clack, so beloved of the railway poets to lull you to sleep, but all's not entirely lost. With the first-class lounge car in the middle of the train, you can come and have a wee nightcap or three if you have any trouble of sleeping. On this train, there's one attendant for every two sleeping cars. Clement of Tefia, how many uh, passengers are you looking after tonight as a sleeping car attendant? 43. 43? Yeah. So you're doing two cars on the in the second class end that, of the that's, train. That's right, yeah. And what do you have to do when people get on? What's um, the job? I go to them and show them their way to their bed and then ask them for their ticket. After that, um, I ask them if they want any refreshment, tea, coffee, or if they prefer to go to the lounge car, they are free to do so. And there is um, a shift steward there to look after them. But with all the passengers on board ready for the night Scotsman's departure, elsewhere on the station a problem has cropped up that will keep Bob Dow out of his bed a little bit longer. Uh, that's fine, George. What I'll do is I'll, uh, I'll actually go across to the office and I'll speak to you from the office then. Oh. oh dear, right. Okay, George, thank you. I've got to go across to the office now to see these passengers and try and arrange a service. Right, well, we'll come with you. Mm -hmm. yeah. Apparently, given wrong information further south, four passengers have missed a vital connection. What I'll do is, I'll see what we can do. I'll speak to our control office and we'll try and arrange a service for you. I'm it'll be a bit later, but uh, it's a wee bit <laughs> long, a shortcut. But it's going out the stairs and then back into the path that way. I can give you a complaint form to say, actually... It's very annoying. Yeah. Yeah. Mind yeah. Because, as I say, it Fine. has been Well, Bob, you've got them safely shepherded onto a train now. It's nearly one o'clock in the morning. What happens now? I'm going home to my bed. I've been here since half past two, so I think I'm entitled to it now. And that's it. The end of the night shift on Waverley Station. The gates swing shut, but not for long. At four o'clock this morning, it all started all over again. Malcolm McCaig in Edinburgh. Uh, just over here, got a train arriving beside me live at York this afternoon. This is the 1504. It's come from Aberdeen and it will be going out to King's Cross in just a few minutes. On its way to King's Cross, it will, of course, go right the way past Paul Coyer at Doncaster. Paul's down there at the signalling centre. Well, tomorrow here in Doncaster, we'll be charting the progress of the Railwatch train as it goes from King's Cross up the eastern line over various level crossings. 
as we saw earlier, they are now controlled from here by closed circuit television. Believe it or not, those cameras even have uh, wash whites on them. We'll test those tomorrow. I'm hoping to have a bash at that. We'll find out how these famous Perspex buttons here affect the signals and the points and how what we do here changes the points down on the tracks. And we'll be doing our best to make sure that 6D25 and our train make their way in the most efficient way possible. Now, earlier on, we were told by Mike about the train from Inverness that was leaving York. Well, I can tell you it's now passing us here. It has mazed up about three or four minutes, and uh, hopefully it will continue in that vein. Back to Mike. Well, thank you, and thanks to everybody here at York Station, who, by the way, are feeling very pleased with themselves at the moment. Every year, BR runs a best-kept station competition. This year, of the 18 entrants in the big station category, York won the award. The judges were representatives of Rotary International, the Tidy Britain Group, and British Rail. And they were presented with their award by Princess Alexandra just a fortnight ago, so congratulations. That's about it from day one of Rail Watch. As that train from Aberdeen heads off, it'll be leaving here in just a few seconds to power its way down the line towards King's Cross Station. Station. Join us again tomorrow, won't you, for more from Rail Watch. It's live each day this week. We are going to be looking at what is really a soap opera. Uh, it's a massive operation, British Rail, and we'll be following our driver, John Swaby, as he goes on his work. Also following the uh, Rail Watch train that was named this afternoon. So it's going to be a fascinating week. We we'll look forward to your company again at about 2.15 tomorrow afternoon on BBC One. But until then, a good afternoon to you. Bye-bye.